This is Thomas Aaron from Fetch Masters Dog Training uh, in Denver. Actually, we're just east of Denver. Um, we specialize in uh, uh, high distraction obedience in outdoor environments. Uh, we do a lot of leash aggression work. And we're most well known probably for our uh, positive hunting dog program. And uh, right now I am super excited to have Sue Brown with us. I have known Sue for, I think, 11 years now. She's one of the first handful of trainers I met when I started here in Denver, started training. And uh, she was the leader of, uh, uh, or founder, I guess, of, of the Colorado Dog Trainers Network. It's sort of a closed door group, dog trainers only. And Sue was the boss. And interestingly, she's also probably the most mature person in the group and the most level-headed and everything else. So I've got nothing but, but good feelings and good memories of Sue. So Sue is the author of, what is, it? it's backwards, but <laughs> Juvenile Delinquent Dogs. Um, in fact, a couple of things about this book. Uh, number one, I actually have made it required reading for all my trainers. They have to read this book. Um, I feel like it gives them a, a, a good foundation of basic knowledge on, and, and sort of a, I almost look at it as, as kind of a reference book. Like you can look up almost any dog problem in it and find a lot of helpful information on it. Um, not only that, but uh, in another uh, online group that I have called the Positive Gun Dog Training Pro Group, um, I host contests, training contests once in a while. And the winners uh, in the past, one of the prizes I've given away is Sue's book. So think very highly of the book. And I'm super stoked to have Sue here to talk about that and talk about uh, dog behavior issues in general. So Sue, welcome. Thank you very much for coming on. So tell, tell everybody, I'm going to make sure you have a bunch of opportunities to plug your business in this because I definitely want people to know about you and know how to find you. So tell us a little bit about your business, where you are, how you got into dog training, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been doing this for, well, I used to keep track of the years. Now I just say since 1996, because I've I lose track of how many years it's been. <laughs> so it's been a long time. Um, so I, I, you know, way back when, since I was a kid, I knew I wanted to get into something animal related. I was always, you know, I was always the person in my family who was most into the animals and the dogs and the cats and everything else. And, uh, but, but initially my background, actually uh, my undergraduate degrees in accounting, um, and I have a master's degree in nonprofit management. So my, my original career was actually in, in nonprofits um, running accounting departments as, as, um, as a controller. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, you know, all my staff back then used to think that the title controller was very appropriate for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I do like to kind of be in charge and, and run things. Um, but while I was doing that on the side evenings and weekends, I was getting into um, volunteering for humane societies and, and, and some of that kind of stuff, volunteering with the dogs and doing tours and, and that. And so I ended up when I moved to Colorado in 1995, um, got in with the Dumb Friends League and was doing a lot of work with them and then started doing a lot of work with Colorado Greyhound adoption and things like that. So. Um, it kind of helped me shift to, to that animal side of things that I always wanted to get into, which was helping animals and helping families with their animals, um, and ended up getting into the dog training and behavior consulting. Um, so I started doing that evenings and weekends, ended up creating my own business and starting that uh, while I was working my other career, and then eventually left behind that other career and have been doing this full time uh, since 2008, full time since 2008, but been doing it much longer than that. Um, and you know, the, the first time I met up with some of my friends from the office after I had left and was doing this full time, met up with them for lunch. And, and the first thing they said was, you look so happy. <laughs> and I was like, yep, I do not miss office life at all. This is what I was meant to do. Yeah. Um, and I love it. And, and, you know, and you know, this time is one of the, one of the, fascinating or fun things about this is 
every time it's a little bit different. You know, you don't get bored because even if you're working on the same stuff, every dog's different. Every dog learns a little differently. So I just, uh, to me, it's just fascinating and there's always more to learn. And if you think you know it all, then you should probably retire and get out of the business because <laughs> yeah. you can never know it all. <laughs> you can never know it all. Every dog's different. So, so there's a, a, a million dog training books out there but I have not seen a ton of them on your particular topic, the juvenile delinquent dogs. What, I assume that you chose that topic to fill, a, fill that, that uh, void? Yeah, exactly. So, so I, knew, I knew years ago that I wanted to write a book, but you know, when I was looking at what was out there, it seemed like there was a lot of, there's puppy books or there's this or that, and it seemed like everything was kind of just, rewording all the same stuff and it was but it was always pretty pretty much same topics and i wasn't finding I, at that time i wasn't finding anything about adolescent dogs that really kind of focused on that time period and the stuff that we go through when they're not not puppies they're they're beyond kind of that puppy stage but they're not mature adults yet um and so that that felt to me like there was there was something missing there that we needed to fill kind of a void there um, and so the other thing that I wanted to do with that was most of the books, all the books that I was reading and I, you know, back then I was reading like every single book I could get my hands on for dog training. And it felt like, it felt like most of them were actually written more for dog trainers, really getting into, you know, the, the learning theory terminology and, you know, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, you know, all, all that stuff. And I thought, you know, most of my students don't really care that much about that. They're like, how do you do this? You know, um, they, they don't care so much about all the terminology and, and sorting all that out. And so I wanted to make sure I was writing a book for, for like my students and other people like that, like not for trainers. Um, and so the other thing I was noticing is when they'd write, you know, you'd get examples of well i worked with this client and they worked with this client and i had this client and i was like you know especially with the adolescent uh topic i wanted to, i wanted to actually write it about what i was going through because i wanted people to see it's not just you're not the only one who's dealing with this stuff literally all of us deal with it during adolescence we deal with these antics that our dogs the dogs uh, put on um and just because I'm a professional dog trainer doesn't mean I don't go through any of that. I go through it too. And so what I wanted to do was as I was raising Romeo, and so Romeo's the one who's, who's got most of the stories in here, I actually was writing the book as he was going through adolescence and I was going through all this stuff with him at that time. And so, you know, my students, I was talking to my students at the time about it and they, you know, they're like, oh, we love this. We love hearing the stories about you and what you're going through makes us feel so much better. So, you know, I wanted to come at it from that perspective of, you know, I'm going through this too. This is, these are my stories. This is the stuff I'm dealing with. I deal with the same stuff that you guys are all dealing with. And, and for my students, I know the people I've talked to personally that I've worked with personally or that I've heard from who've gotten the book and read the book and are other parts of the country in that is they really appreciate me sharing those kind of stories because it makes them feel better about what they're going through and that they, everybody deals with it and they can, they can get through it too. So how do you, when you say juvenile delinquent dogs, um, can you tell the audience a little bit more about like what age group you're talking about? Who, who are these dogs? What are their problems? What are their challenges to us? Um, who are their owners? How do you know if you have a juvenile delinquent dog? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I, I teach a group class that's called Juvenile Delinquent Dogs too. And the funny thing is when people look at it, if they belong in that class, they know it right. And they're like, that's my dog. <laughs> I need that. Um, you know, it, it, it was a little bit tongue in cheek. You know, I, I wanted something that kind of popped out to people and they're like, oh, that sounds interesting. That I need to kind of look into. Um, because when I was first writing it with my editors, they were like, mm, I don't know, that sounds kind of negative. I don't know if people are going to like that. And I'm like, you know, the feedback I'm getting from my students is that resonates with them, is that we're in that adolescent stage. We're not the cute puppy anymore. We're not that little puppy where everything's cute. Um, now you look like an adult, but you're not really an adult yet. 
Um, and we've got some of these things that feel like still puppy behaviors in some cases that aren't uh, growing. Um, and so typically it's, you know, it starts around six months um, and can last to 18 months, two years, three years, depending on the breed, as we know, some dogs mature faster than others. Um, and so, so it's, really, it's really meant mostly for that adolescent stage from six months to 18 months plus. Um, but you know, the other thing I tell people is it's, it's, your dog can kind of fit into that no matter what age they are. Um, you know, whether they actually are an adolescent dog or just act like it sometimes um, and, and, you know, aren't always acting like the mature adult we think they should be. Mm -hmm. um, or even sometimes the puppies are kind of heading into adolescence a little bit early and testing that independence a little bit. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's not always intended for the ones who are having problems. You know, I, I have a lot of people who, who say it's great for helping them prevent problems. Um, so, you know, kind of getting familiar with some of the stuff and working on, on getting ahead of things. So in my juvenile delinquents group class that I do, I tell people, your dog doesn't have to be a juvenile delinquent. Um, this sometimes helps us prevent that from happening. So it's real, you know, it's really intended for all adolescent dogs, not just the, the problem children or the troublemakers. Mm, okay, good, good. So I'd like to I'd like to kind of move a little bit into your philosophy of solving dog behavior problems. Like, what are some go to paradigms or or go to principles that people should be familiar with when they're dealing with various behavior issues? Are, is there is there a systematic way to look at these things? Yeah. So, um, and I do have I do have a. a uh, process for kind of working through specific issues. So I cover a lot of problem behaviors in the book, but I also have, um, you know, a 10 step uh, part for so solving other problems that aren't in here. Um, but, but without getting into those specific details uh, at the moment, what I always start with when I'm working with a client or I've got somebody in group class who asks about something or somebody, you know, asks for some, some feedback on a blog post or something. Um, what I always try and get people to look at first is what, what is the actual problem? Um, and is it, is it just a symptom of an underlying problem? Because I always want to make sure if there's an underlying problem that I'm addressing that. So barking, for example, is one I've been getting a lot of questions about lately this past week or two, um, seems to be a common theme for me at, at the moment. Um, and, and I always tell people from the get-go with, with an issue like barking, for example, is I really want to look at it in a little more detail and figure out what's actually causing the barking. Because barking can come from a lot of different areas, a lot of different places, um, and it can mean a lot of different things. And so I, wanna, I don't want to address every barking problem in the exact same way. If it's attention-seeking barking versus a dog who's fearful, um, I want to make sure I address those things properly. So, so the barking might be the problem, but it also is really a symptom of the underlying problem that I want to make sure I address. So I always want to look at, am I looking at the big picture? Am I catching the whole problem or am I just catching a piece of it? Um, and then from there, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm looking at how to resolve it, not by getting rid of that, but by filling that void with something else. So, so just as the barking example, if I've got a dog who's barking at something, if I, if I stop the barking, but I don't address how the dog's feeling about the thing or what's going on, that, that underlying issue can come out somewhere else. So I don't want to just stop or, or put, a, put a plug in that problem. I want to make sure I'm filling that void, that behavior with an alternative that's acceptable. So if I've got a dog who's jumping, for example, adolescent dogs tend to tend to be have issues oftentimes with jumping on people or jumping on counters or other things. And I want to make sure that if I'm getting rid of that behavior, that problematic behavior, I'm filling that void with something else so I don't end up with another problem behavior to deal with beyond that. If okay. that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Like a uh... The terminology I, I like to use for that is when you try to snuff out a problem without addressing the root cause of it, if you fail to address that root, root cause, you end up playing whack-a-mole with different yep. problems that come up. You're like, yep. 
So. Yeah, and what I always tell people is sometimes the the replacement behavior, if you don't fill that void, sometimes is worse than the original behavior you were trying to get rid of. So I always want to make sure we we are the ones filling that void and helping helping the dog understand what to do in that situation, right? So I get so many people who say, "How do I stop jumping? How do I stop pulling? How do I whatever?" Um, and I always say, the question I really want you to ask is what do I want instead? What's the behavior I want to see in that situation? Because that's what I really want to focus on is how to get the behavior that I want to see. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because I think as a dog trainer, one of the most common questions I get is how do I stop the dog from doing that? Right. Yep. And fill in the yep. blank. How do I stop it? And uh, because I think people, they just don't want that to happen. But, right. but it, for some reason, for people, it's not intuitive to, to ask, what would I rather the dog do? That, 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 that's not the question that naturally pops into their head. It's not. But I try and get my students to start thinking a little bit differently about that. Because when, I, when I'm helping somebody, whether it's in a group class or private training or, or, or any other way, um, I always want I want it, my focus is to give them the tools to work through if other issues pop up, to have the tools to kind of work through other issues too, um, so that they don't necessarily always have to call me for everything, which is perfectly fine. They're welcome to call me for help with that stuff, but I want to give them the ability to solve those problems and think through and go, well, what would Sue say about this? How would, what would we look at? And so it gives them the tools to actually deal with a lot of other stuff instead of just that one problem. Yeah, you want them to channel their inner Sue Brown. <laughs> I get a lot of students who say, you know, I saw, I just, I picture you in my ear saying this, and then <laughs> I figure out how to deal with it. <laughs> hopefully, so, hopefully I'm the little angel sitting on the shoulder, not the little devil sitting on the shoulder. <laughs> well, I mean, it's okay to be a little bit of both, I think. A little bit of both. <laughs> um, so, when you, when you start, working with people and teaching them how to solve problems. Um, I'm guessing that you as a trainer, similar to myself, that a lot of your, a lot of your students get it. They learn a lot, but there seems to be certain students that have a, have a, just have a hard time getting their mind around it and have, they struggle with it a lot more than others. What would you say, what in your experience, are some factors that make it less likely that a person will be able to, to use a systematic approach to solving problems versus factors that makes it more likely that they'll be able to? What are, what are contributing factors to success or failure with solving issues? That's the short sure. answer. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I have some students who, if I kind of give them the, the big picture and a general idea of where we want to go, they're like, great, I can run with that. Um, I have others who go, no, I need help every step of the way because it's hard to, for a lot of people, it's hard to, in, in regard to dog training, hard to break down those steps without some help, help doing that. And so, you know, what I tell my students is I'm willing to help, especially like with private training where we can put, where we're focusing on specific issues is, I can help you as much or as little as you want. I'm, I'm there to help you through all that because um, even though, like, like I've got a lot of parents with young kids who say, you know, when I'm helping them solve an issue with their puppy and they go, oh, it's kind of like raising kids. It's just like I do with my kids. I'm like, yeah, it really is. But sometimes it's hard to parse out how to do it with a dog versus with a kid or, or whatever, whatever it is. So I think a lot of people you know, understand the concept, but applying it in regard specifically to their dog, um, is just, it's hard to think outside of that. Um, and so, you know, that's where I want to be ready to help and give them each step and help them break it down into steps if we need to, um, because it's not intuitive for everybody. And I was just working with somebody the other day who said, gosh, you know, everything you're telling me just it seems, it seems so just the opposite of what I would naturally be inclined to do. Yeah. Um, and I said, that's okay. That's why I'm here to help you work through that. Um, because it's not always, it's not always intuitive. Um, but then I had other people who go, oh, it just seems like such common sense. Um, but it's not really, because it's not something that most people are used to working through and dealing with. Um, especially if you've got an issue 
Like if I've got a dog who um, has bitten someone, I deal with a lot of bite issues. And you know, if people have never had a dog who's had those types of issues before, it's really hard to process that and think through it because they've, they've never had dogs that have had any of those types of issues. And so um, it's, it's not something that I expect to be intuitive and easy for everyone to figure out without. And, and that's, you know, that's why Tom, you and I and, and others like us are out there is to help people sort through that stuff because it's, I, I always try and remember like my husband is very much into the technology and computers kind of stuff. And so when he's trying to help me work through, he's like, well, you just do this and this and this and this. And I'm like, that's just right over my head. And, and, and I try and remember that feeling <laughs> when I'm working with students who, who get that same feeling with me when I'm telling them, well, it's so easy. You just do this. And they're like, it's not easy at all. Yeah. Uh, and so I just want to make sure I'm, I'm being empathetic to helping them break things down as much as we need to, because it's not intuitive for everybody. Right. You know, I think also along those lines is I think as humans, our intuition's wrong sometimes because we, we want to anthropomorphize. I think that's the right way to say that. Or we want to take an anthropomorphic view of the dog. We want to think of that dog as a human. We want to do things with that dog the way we would do it with a human. Explain it to the dog the way we would explain it to a human. And then we're befuddled when that doesn't work, right? All of a sudden the dog is dumb or stubborn or, you know, that sort of thing. And we start applying these human characteristics to it. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think part of that too, is we're, we're projecting our own perception onto it. And it's very hard sometimes to look at it from the dog's perspective, because yes, we are anthropomorphizing. We're going, well, this is how I feel about it. This is, you know, and they're thinking that's how their dog is perceiving it. And oftentimes their dog's perception is very different from theirs. Yeah. See, let's, let's go ahead and pop into a couple of questions. I think that'll be a good way to maybe help people start getting their mind around how you think about solving these issues. And, and, you know, I realize, and everybody in the audience should realize that that when somebody asks a dog trainer a question in a forum like this, there's so much information that we don't know. So all we can really do is look at your, your text or your email and, you know, draw what conclusions we can about it. But inevitably when we do something like that somebody says you know oh yeah i've already tried that or or oh no that's not the case this is the case we can only go by what you have written so um hopefully sue will be able to help you with some of your questions but i i think that in my mind the more important for the uh thing for you guys is to is to kind of figure out how sue processes these problems how she looks at them right and then that'll you know that'll help guide you into how to think about them so hopefully that makes sense so we have a question here from uh thomas croyle um he is a he's actually a fetch master's client he says as someone who has only rescued adolescent dogs, I'm really excited to read your book. If you had to recommend doing one thing with your dog every day to improve obedience, what would it be? Yes, great question. So I think about that a lot. And, and I ask people, sometimes my students, what's, what, what do you think is the most important thing to teach your dog? And my answer is always different from everyone else's. Um, my, my, my answer to that would be if, if I could only work on one thing, so if I brought an adolescent dog home and I could only work on one thing, it would actually be eye contact. I work on that a ton with whatever age dog I bring home, whether it's a puppy, adolescent, adult dog, um, because I want great connection and great tune in. And so for my, for my own dogs, personally, eye contact is a way for them to connect with me. It's a way for them to ask permission for things. It's a way for them to ask for help when something worries them. Right. Um, so I'll just give you a quick example. So with, with Romeo, the, the Vishla that I tell all the stories about in my book, he, um, he was probably about four, four-ish years old um, when he developed some sensitivity to thunder and gunfire, which he'd had no problem with prior to that. Um, and, and we live out in a rural area, and a lot of people like to do their target practice, so we hear gunfire at various points in time. Um, and he, rather than panicking about it, which a lot of dogs do, right, if they're afraid of thunder or things, they'll kind of panic about things and, and try and take off. 
he immediately would come to me and make eye contact with me and ask me for how to handle the situation, which is exactly what I had trained him to do prior to that was if something worries you, come to me, connect with me. Um, I work a lot toward off-leash reliability like you do, Tom, off-leash stuff. Um, I want my dogs tuning in and connecting with me. And if I've got that great tune in and connection, there's a lot of other stuff I don't actually need to have as solid. So, so like with Romeo, um, once we got through adolescence and we'd, we'd really done heavy training, um, for the rest of his life, for his entire adult life, he was able to be off leash. And I, I could probably count on my hand, I could probably count on one hand the number of times I needed to call him to come because he was so tuned in and connected. He was always checking in and keeping track of me because, and the lead off point to all of that was that eye contact that we'd done early on. Hmm, very good. Very interesting. Um, we have another question that just popped in here and I don't recognize this person. Uh, it's probably someone on my mailing list, not a fetch master's client. They say, um, let me shorten this up just a little bit. Uh, my dog always fence fights with the neighbor dog. I've talked to the neighbors. They don't care. And I have not been able to stop it. What do you recommend? Yeah, that's, that's a, a hard one. If you, it's a hard one if you don't have any buy-in on the other side to help deal with stuff, right? If you've got a dog on the other side who's always willing to fence fight, it's very hard to work on that. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some clients, I've had, a, I've had a few clients who neighbors on both sides who hired me together to help them work on both sides of the fence, which is awesome, but you don't normally get, <laughs> you don't normally get that, that level of buy-in. Um, so, so my recommendation in that case is initially, initially, if I want to start to address this, I've got to try and curb the behavior because if we've been practicing it for a while, it becomes a bad habit, right? So a lot of dogs get to the point where they don't even remember why they started doing this. They, this is just what they do. As soon as they step out that back door, they're looking to see if that other dog's over there going over to, to see, and that's the first thing they think of. And if I've got a if I've got a dog like that, I want to curb that to begin with. So I, I'm probably going to take them out on leash for a while um, and make sure I'm managing that behavior. I want to help them start to think about other things. So if, if, if I've got a dog who immediately is looking for that the minute they step out in the backyard, if that's the first thing they're thinking about, I've got to get them thinking about other things. Um, and so I can address, I can work on that specific issue at the fence line. But if that's the first thought in their head when they step outside, I want to try and curb that. I want to get them actually thinking about other things, take them out on leash, do some other stuff, have them focusing on things that are and making things more important out there than what's on the other side of the fence. And I do that whether dog's fence fighting or if I've got a dog who's jumping the fence and getting out and going doing stuff. I want to make sure that whatever's within my backyard is more interesting than what's on the other side. Okay. Okay. We have some more backyard questions coming at okay. you. Um, but before we do more backyard questions, I'm going to give you a break from them because I think the backyard questions are going to get a bit on the tough side. Um, but let's see. So this is an interesting question. So Amber is asking this question. How do you teach eye contact? Now she has, she, uh, she asks, is it name recognition conditioning? So Amber, the way Fetch Masters teaching it, teaches it, yes, we teach it by teaching name recognition. But I'm, I'm curious how Sue teaches it because there's often more than one way to do just about anything with dogs. Yes, which is part of the fun of dog training, right, yeah. Tom? It's, there's always more than one way to do things. Exactly. Yeah, which is, which is why I love it. Um, yeah, for me, it is different than name recognition. Um, and... and Partly, partly the reason I separate those out is because most people, when they say the name, aren't looking for eye contact. They're not looking for that level of connection that I'm looking for with my eye contact. And so I really have two pieces of the eye contact. One is voluntary and one is cued. So I start with the voluntary eye contact. I start developing that. I start, I want you to offer eye contact and I will pay you well for it. And then eventually I put it on cue. 
Um, so for me, that I call that watch me. Um, some people call it look or focus or whatever. And I do cover this in the book. I cover this as one of my, what I consider one of my foundation behaviors. So the name to me is just turn your general attention toward me so I can tell you what to do next. For me, the eye contact is I want good solid eye contact. I want you holding it. I want you to be able to hold it for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds maybe. Um, typically, it's, uh, it may only be a few seconds. But like with Romeo, I mean, Romeo could stare down, he could stare me down for as long as I wanted. He had such phenomenal eye contact and people would, rec people would comment on it all the time. They're like, he is so focused on you. It's amazing. How do you do that? I'm like, a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work to get there. But the way I start it, the way I start it, um, and I work on this with Zuka, who's my Vishla now, who's 13 months old. Um, I started the day I brought him home. I start, I start at mealtime. I use mealtime for training. Um, and I have food. And I typically start with food in both hands out to the sides. And at first, the puppy or the adolescent dog or whoever I'm working with focuses on the hands and the food in the hands. Right. And at some point, they glance at my face. Even if it's accidental, when they're going from this hand over to this hand, they catch, they catch my eye or they glance at my face. I mark that and reward it. And I do, I do that over and over and over again until pretty quickly when I hold my hands out, my dog's looking immediately at my face. Can I, let, me, let me pause you right there with the question. Yep. So are you doing this via clicker training or, or are you yes. using a verbal cue? I, I, I'm not using a verbal cue. I'm not putting it on cue yet, but I'm using a marker. So that could be Probably a clicker. Marker, that could yeah. be a yes verbal marker. That right, could right. be, but I'm using a marker, yes, to mark and reward it. Because I want to make sure I'm marking the the moment they look at my face gotcha because i want my dogs to to learn to focus on me and not on the food because at some point the food's not going to be there and then what do they focus on um and so i want them learning always to focus on my face and connect with me so i build lots of voluntary eye contact first before i put it on cue and then i can ask for it when i need it but to me i want first and foremost that voluntary eye contact i want you to connect with me um, Again, like I was talking about earlier, eventually for permission for stuff, for if you're worried about something, I want you to connect with me if you need anything from me or want anything from me. Okay. Um, let's see what else we got here coming in. Oh, sorry, I got a, all right. So I want to go over to one of Susan Franklin's questions. She has a couple of them. Um, so a little background here. Uh, Susan Franklin has a German short hair, which is my favorite dog. Um, and we've been doing distance coaching with her. She lives in Oregon. We've been working a lot on pushing this dog toward more responsiveness, more off leash type of stuff. And, and Susan is a rock star. I've got to tell you, like she has gone, she has been very impressive. She's gone from having no clue what to do to just really applying herself to this. And she's made a ton of progress, but she has a couple of pretty sticky issues. Okay. Um, and I think one, I think for sure one of them I've talked to her about, but it, it's still an ongoing issue. So I think maybe getting some fresh eyes on the problem sure. might be an interesting thing to do here. So I'm going to, let me ask one of her questions here first. She says, um, have a three-year-old extremely energetic uh, German short circuit pointer who we adopted at one and a half years old. When we first got him, he was a barbarian. Training's helped a lot, but there are times when he's definitely a juvenile delinquent. Okay, here's question one. Outside in our one-acre prop, one-acre fenced property, if allowed to run free, he flies maniacally through everything inside, including flower beds and hot pursuit of creatures who find habitat in our garden. Uh, chipmunks, butterflies, all of that. Um, we're managing his behavior at present by keeping him, keeping him with us at all times and always on a long leash. Um, so basically the problem here is if this dog is not being actively managed, he's going to take off. And he, So she, Susan has this freakishly beautiful backyard with flower beds and it's, it's beautiful, but this dog will just rip right through them. So... Um, what what would you suggest like how would you approach something like that yeah so so if i can if you can if you can clarify this tom if i don't know if you can or not 
but are we trying to stop the dog from running? Are we trying to stop them from going through specific areas? Stop them from chasing? Is there some? Is there a specific piece of that that we're? I think Susan wants the dog. I think ultimately what Susan's goal is for the dog is to go outside with the dog, for the dog to generally have fun in its backyard. It's got a big backyard, but to mm -hmm. stay out of her flower beds. Okay. Uh, and and Susan has had to do a lot of management with this dog. And I think sure. that what she's wanting is to get past the management phase and for the dog to have like aha moment, don't run through the flower beds. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Um, yeah, so, so and, and certainly after all of this, if you, you know, if you have a picture or video you want to send me and I can, we can talk more about it outside of this, but um, just based on what I'm hearing there is, uh, I'd look at, is it clearly defined? Are the flower beds clearly defined that we can just set up areas where we can do basically some boundary training and go, that is an off limit area, um, right? So like with, like with Romeo, when he was younger on our property, we're on 13 and a half acres and we, we are off a busy road. So the, the speed limit on our road is 50 miles an hour, but people usually go in like 65, right? Um, and when Romeo was an adolescent, we did not have that fenced at all. There was no fence to stop him from running out into that road where people are going 65 miles an hour. Um, but I boundary trained him. We do now have a fence now across there. Um, but I boundary trained him to understand where the boundaries are and where you cannot go. Um, and so, I mean, this is a bigger, bigger space, but he, he knew exactly where that boundary was and he would always turn back from that. Mm -hmm. um, same with my Greyhound, like with Zuzu, um, further up our property, we have barbed wire fence, so there's a clearly defined area of the boundary. Um, but even when deer would take off, she would not, even though she could easily get through that barbed wire fence, she would not go through it because I had trained her not to go through there. So I think the flower beds would be a similar issue of a boundary training of this, this, is, a, this is off limits area. Um, and it takes certainly takes some practice to get there, but I think dogs can certainly be trained of where those boundaries are, um, even if it's a boundary within the that yard space, as long as it's clearly defined that it's easy for us and the dog to identify what that boundary is. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. How how would you go about that? How would you go about so this this is actually this is actually similar to some stuff I've talked to Susan about. So how would you go mm -hmm. about uh, obviously it's not working yet, right? So how, right. Would, how would you go about teaching the dog that boundary just with flower beds in general? Yeah, so so I'd start out with the long line or some type of leash, right? And so when they're getting close to that boundary, I'm redirecting back. So like right now I'm working with a, with a client who has two um, adolescent dogs who they have they don't have horses but neighbors on both sides have horses and the dogs like to go eat horse manure <laughs> so we're working on boundary training for them too right um and so whether it's flower beds or you know wh whatever it is we're trying to stay away from is i want to make sure i'm walking you near it and then when you start heading toward it i'm directing you away so i'm constantly building this behavior pattern of always veering away from whatever that is in this case the flower beds um, so I don't mind if you go around, I don't mind if you go past, but, but we have kind of a, a, a line we draw. So I'll give you, I'll give you another example. So I, I was working with a, with a client whose dog was attacking their fence. Um, they lived in a suburban neighborhood and anytime either squirrels would run along the top of the fence or people would walk along the sidewalk alongside, the dog would literally attack the fence. Um, and so what we had to train the dog, and so I worked with them to train the dog, to um and they had landscaping around the inside of the fence with with like rock or mulch or something um and so we established the new boundary of the fence was not the boundary any longer but the the landscaping was the boundary right. and so we trained him to stay within within that boundary and not cross you know where you might normally have flower beds or something they had you know their their landscaping it wasn't just to get to stay out of landscaping it was to stay away from the fence because he was literally destroying a six foot wooden fence. I mean, it looked like a beaver lived in that backyard. It was so bad mm. um, and he was injuring himself. Um, but we, we trained him to stay within that boundary of the landscaping, um, which would be similar to a flower bed. Um, and that 
Um, we we're always redirecting away, but we were making the other area more interesting and, and doing away with any interest in that area. Okay. Well, I mean, that's, there are some similarities in that to the way I do it. Um, but there are some differences too. So Susan, uh, hopefully you've been able to pick up on that, some of those differences and maybe that'll give you something to, to try there. And Susan's other problem with this uh, GSP, and this is one I think, um, bearing in mind, she has a beautiful backyard. And so this is uh, a pain point for her. She says, digging, this is where we need help. I've read your excellent book, but the solutions included there do not seem to be sufficient. We have done our best to get rid of wild rabbits who love our garden, but short of poison, which I'm not willing to use, they elude us. He gets plenty of exercise since we are outdoor people and we do not leave him alone outside. I do not think that giving him a digging area of his own will work since he is not digging for the sheer love of it. He's digging to reach in search of prey. Yep. I'm trying yep. to manage this behavior by keeping him with me in the garden, but there are admittedly times when my attention is not on him. Sure. Yeah, that's much harder. If they're digging to get at something specific, giving them an alternative digging area isn't going to help. Right, the alternative digging area works for a dog who just loves to dig, um, uh, like Zuka does, my, my guy now. He just, sometimes when he's got a little pent up energy, he just loves to dig a hole. Um, but if we're digging to get at something, then we've got to address that specifically because digging is sort of the symptom of the problem we're trying to get at whatever's there. Um, that to me would probably be more of a leave it type thing, is that it's an automatic leave it for any rodents that are underground, <laughs> essentially, right. Um, right, which is a tough one. That's a tough one. But, you know, I think, I think it's doable eventually, but it definitely is one of the more challenging ones to deal with. Um, but like with Zuzu, my greyhound, um, and you know, Tom, we lost her last summer, but um, she was a phenomenal bunny hunter. You know, greyhounds were originally bred to hunt rabbits, and she was phenomenal at it. We used to have a bunny problem, and then you <laughs> we did more. Um, but, but she was trained, she was trained right to the point that she, she was allowed to chase bunnies on our property as long as she didn't cross the property line. But if she was on a leash, she was not allowed to chase and that. So, so for me, that was the rule was she was allowed to chase if she was off leash, but not if she was on, I could have her on leash and a bunny could run right across in front of us and she wouldn't even flinch. She would just, she was like, yeah, well, I'll get him next time when I'm off leash. Um, Right, so, so I think a lot of times we think that if I've got a dog with high prey drive, I can't, you know, you can't train that out of them. I'm like, mm, but you can always train self-control. Um, and, and in this case, obviously it's gonna be a challenge, but to me that would be the self-control of not going after rabbits that are underground is that's an automatic leave it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd probably be working on it that way, that if it's underground, you can't chase it, right? It's there. Um, you don't get to dig those up. That's just an automatic leave it. And certainly that takes a lot of work to get there, but I'd be looking at it kind of from that perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense. And it brings up two points, which I'm jotting down because I'll forget them for sure if I don't. Mm -hmm. um, one is that I, I think dogs are particularly capable. So, so as you and I know, Sue, and all of our students eventually end up learning is dogs are not generalists, right? They don't learn that one behavior applies everywhere. They have to be taught in different scenarios. Yep. So, so they're contextual. And yes. so like what you're uh, talking about with your greyhound is in the context of being on leash, he knew I don't do that. But off leash, it's a different story. There, it's okay, right? It's two different contexts, yep. um, and I I deal with that with that the issue of context a lot with my clients. Um, but but that's that is one thing for I think people to to pull out of that is that the dogs need to understand what you want them to do in certain contexts. Yes. But the other thing that is really interesting here is a lot of times owners want to have their cake and eat it too, right? They, <laughs> yeah. they, um, and, and Susan, I'm not saying this at all to pick on you. I'm just, sometimes these hard, certain problems are extremely difficult to solve. So like, you don't want to get rid of the rabbits, 
but you don't want your your dog hunting them right you've got a german short hair i mean it's a hunting machine and so you some you, if you're if you can't if you can't make the choice to get rid of them if that's unacceptable then you can try to train it but there's possibility that it's going to come down to a management issue i mean that that's kind of the way i see it do you see it that way sue or i mean yeah i mean part of what i'd look at like my next question would be like if you're there can you call the dog off so if he's digging and you're there can you call him away from that um right so part of it's just building that self-control of does he have any self-control in that moment, <laughs> right? If you're there, and ultimately I'd want him to be able to leave it when you're not there, but I wouldn't expect that certainly anytime soon. Um, but, you know, if, if that dog, if you can't even call him off it when you're there, that says we've, we've got still some impulse control stuff to work through and some reliability stuff to work through on recalls and things like that. Um, but if I can call them off it, then at least that says, right, that dog's got, some self-control there. He's got some ability to make make good decisions. Um, we just need to expand on that, if that makes sense. So another question came in here. Interestingly, I think it was spurred by my having your cake and eating it too comment. <laughs> but the, the the gentleman Bill he says, um, he goes, I like to play rough with my dogs. We wrestle dogs put their mouths on me, but I don't want my dog putting its mouth on guests. So what is that? So is this, is the answer to that problem? Is it a contextual issue? It's okay to play with me and put your mouth on me when we're wrestling, but it's not okay to put it on guests. Is it, is it a contextual thing or is this a, a situation where the owner can't be expected to have their cake and eat it too? You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I do see what you're saying, yeah. And Tom, the answer, as you already know, if you want to sound like a true professional, is well, it depends. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> right. Um, I actually just had this question uh, yesterday in my puppy class. I've got a guy who likes to wrestle with his puppy, and he says, "Is this going to cause a problem with her being mouthy with others, and when the grandchildren visit, and things like that?" Um, and, and and you know it. Partly in part depends on the dog and how good they are at differentiating that. So I'd say the short answer is if you want to be certain the dog's not going to be mouthy with others, it's best not to be mouthy with anybody. That being said, um, some people do love to wrestle with their dogs and, and, and that's okay if you can put it, um, if you can put it on cue is what I would suggest is so just like just like with jumping, whether it's wrestling or, or jumping, a lot of times I get like one person in the house who loves it when the dog jumps up and everybody else hates it. Yeah, uh, I, I go, <laughs> and I say, you know, that's okay, but here, here's, here's what I recommend in those types of cases, whether it's wrestling or jumping or whatever the behavior is. If one person loves it and nobody else does, is you make not doing it the default behavior, not jumping up or not wrestling. The default is you don't put your mouth on humans. The only time it's allowed is when it's invited, but you have to be very clear about when it's invited and you got to be really, really careful and structured about making sure it's only done when you invite it. Right. So I think it can be done. I mean, erring on the safe side, if you want to be really careful that they're not being mouthy with anyone, the safe, the safest option would be to not do it at all. Right. Um, but dogs are very good at reading context. I mean, your dogs can tell what you're going to do next based on which shoes you're putting on or which clothes you're putting on. They're like, oh, we're going for a walk or, oh, he's leaving, um, right? Dogs are really good at picking up on context, but we need to be really clear about when it's okay and when it's not if we're going to do that. Right. You know, as you're talking about that and as I'm, I'm pondering the question that guy just asked, I, I'm sitting here thinking, am I a hypocrite or... <laughs> why do I do the things I do? So here's an example. I play very rough with my dogs. I always have, I don't care if they put their mouth on me. I wrestle with them. We slap box, we chase all kinds of stuff. I do it all the time. The dogs love it. I love it. My dogs don't play with Linda. 
uh, they love Linda. They go to Linda for comfort. They hang out with Linda. They lay down with Linda. But Linda doesn't play like I do with the dogs. Right. And the dogs know, right? They don't do that with Linda. If they want to do that, they come to dad, right? Yep. Yep. It's that simple. They're very contextual. So that said, I would give people the same answer you did, right? It, the safe way to go about it is don't do that, right? And uh, I look at, uh, in, in my line of work, the skill set of retrieving is very, very important. Um, you want a dog that will go retrieve uh, an object or a bird or whatever, bring it back to you, put it in your hand and let it go. And so people ask me, well, can I do that and play tug with my dog? Uh, because if you play tug with the dog, is it going to want to keep that item from you? Well, mm -hmm. the, the true answer is yes, you can play tug with your dog. Your dog's absolutely capable of understanding the context to the difference between retrieving and playing tug. Um, if you simply use different objects for retrieving than you do tug, you don't have a problem. That said, um, when I'm training somebody to train their own dog to retrieve, I tell them, don't play tug with it. Why? It's not because it can't be done. It's because if, if a client is paying me a lot of money, or a better example is if I have a hunting dog in my board and train program, I will never play tug with that dog. That person's pay, paying me a lot of money to teach that dog to retrieve. The right. last thing I want to do is take any kind of risk that that dog's going to bring a bird back to the owner and then try to tug with it. So right. I don't do tug, right? right. So, so it's, it's, a, it's more a matter of the best bet versus what's actually possible, right? Do you, do you yep. want to, do you want the most likely to succeed solution or do you want to know what's possible? So yeah. kind of the same thing. So I guess I'm, I feel a little bit hypocritical about it, but, but yeah, uh, the context is possible, but then do you want to take the risk? I think. Yeah. Well, and you just, if you're going to, you have to be really clear about separating those two pieces out. Right. Because if you're not really clear about when this is okay and when it's not okay, then that's where, that's where it gets a gray area and the dog gets confused and it's like, yeah, it's fine to tug with anything. Right. So kind of closing the circle here, this, this um, interview is going to end up being a YouTube video. Um, and in the show notes, I'm going to have all of Sue's contact information because I want you guys to be able to find her. Um, so Sue, can you talk just a little bit about where you're located, what kind of services you offer, yep. um, what things that you specialize in, what things you like to work with, that kind of thing, so that people can say, you know, they know if they they know. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my business is the Light of Dog. We are located in Sedalia, Colorado. So we're just south of Denver. We're in between Denver and Colorado Springs. Um, we do, I do private training. I do a lot of behavior consulting with, with more serious issues. I do work with a lot of bite cases. Um, I do group classes. Uh, we do boarding here as well. We do not do any boarding trains, but we do boarding, uh, mostly for our clients. Um, my focus, my focus is on a great, well-behaved family dog. So one of the things I talk about in my book is well-behaved versus well-trained. I have a lot of students who want a well-trained dog. Every single one of my students wants a well-behaved dog. Not everybody cares about a well-trained dog. They just want a dog who's easy to live with, they can take for a walk and not be dragged down the street and, and that kind of thing. That's my focus. I don't, I don't focus on competition. I don't focus on, on any of that kind of stuff. I focus on, are you enjoying life with your dog? <laughs> and, and, right, and what I tell people when I meet with them, when I meet for private training is, if you, um, if you are happy and your dog is happy and everything's wonderful, I don't care if you, if your dog doesn't know how to sit. I don't care if you do, I don't care if you do any training with your dog, if you're happy, but that's not why you call me in. <laughs> you don't call me in to brag about how wonderful your life is with your dog. You're, something's going on or you're trying to prevent problems from developing. Um, and that's where I like to focus is either helping resolve problems so that we can live happily and coexist and live that dream life that you anticipated when you brought home the dog um, or working to prevent. So I start, I work with puppies on up through 
um, elderly dogs. I work with all ages. Um, I work with all, pretty much all behavior issues, um, regular obedience kind of, you know, family manner stuff up through specific behavior issues and things. Um, but my, my love is that adolescent, that adolescent age, because that is where most people get driven crazy. Um, you know, the puppy's cute. You can deal with a lot of stuff when you've got this cute little puppy staring at you. <laughs> but once they get a little bit bigger and a little bit rowdier and a little bit harder to control, that's where a lot of dogs end up getting given up, right? They end up in the shelters or the rescue groups or things because people can't, they think the puppy stuff they're going to outgrow and they don't magically outgrow it all the time. Um, and to me, that's where I like to spend a lot of my time and focus is helping prevent those problems or, or curb those problems and, and get to that happy, lovely dog that you envisioned when you brought a dog home. Okay. Um, two other quick questions. I'm actually not up to speed on this, and I probably should be. Um, now, I remember you used to teach classes uh, in South Denver somewhere. Do you I still do? Yeah. You, do you still do that? Nope. All of my group classes right now are, are down at the farm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and when you do private coaching, what what areas do you cover with your private coaching? Yep. So, so anybody's welcome to come to me. So I do a lot of training at the farm. So I have people come from all over the Denver metro area and up from Colorado Springs to see me. Um, so anybody can come there. Um, I can do online sessions uh, from anywhere. Um, and then the, the travel, if I'm going to people, I cover kind of the South metro area. So kind of along the South C70, C470 corridor, um, Littleton, Highlands Ranch, Centennial, Lone Tree, over to Parker, um, Larkspur, Castle Rock, Sedalia, um, kind of that South Metro area. Okay. Awesome. Um, and so your business is, it's the light of um, So with that, I'm going to tell Sue, thank you so much for, um, coming here and virtually speaking and uh, doing this interview and, and talking to uh, the audience and answering some questions and uh, loved having you. And hopefully we can do something like this again at some point. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. It was fun. My pleasure. My pleasure. You have a good one. Thanks. You too.